Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to the session on uh, ERCP and EUS uh, in the United States. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to moderate this session along with Greg Ginsburg, who I hopefully will be joining us uh, in, the, in the near future here. Uh, but I want to say um, good morning to those in Tokyo, uh, a very, very early good morning to those in uh, Europe, uh, and a good evening for those of us in the United States. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to uh, chair this session, and we've got uh, fantastic speakers um, for this session. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to, uh, to Haru and all of the organizers for this meeting. Um, these are really extraordinary times that we're in, uh, and it's, um, uh, it's really very special, I think, to go to this extra effort to uh, bring us together, even though not physically, at least to bring us together for an educational event um, that we can all share in. So I think without further ado, uh, I will go ahead and, and begin this session. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our first speaker. Uh, again, he's someone who needs no, or, uh, no uh, introduction. Uh, Norio Fukami has uh, been uh, one of the uh, brightest and best uh, endoscopists, uh, certainly in the United States for quite some time. Uh, he's done training in both Japan as, as well as in the United States. Uh, he was on faculty at MD Anderson, uh, then at Colorado, and now uh, is at the Mayo Clinic. And I think that uh, Norio is, is certainly, um, I think, at the top of the field in the United States with resections. But I think something that's been maybe lost just a little bit um, in all the, uh, the craziness about ESD and, and resections is that Norio is really a master endoscopist in general and has a, a very keen interest in pancreatic biliary endoscopy. So uh, today we've asked Norio uh, to talk about the management of hyalur strictures. So Norio, uh, welcome my friend. Thank, thank you, Rob. That was a very kind introduction. It's ex really exciting to be uh, one of the speaker among those superstars and legendary endoscopists. And uh, I would like to uh, make it sort of a live case kind of feeling. So uh, let's hope that we can get the live feel, uh, sensation of the, the, the course. So let's start the video, please. Hello, I'm Norio Fukami at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. It is my honor and pleasure to be a part of Tokyo 2020. Thank you, Professor Inoue, for your kind invitation. My talk is management of difficulty associated with hyalur stricture. With the interest of time, I needed to cut one case off and I apologize. This is my COI. Case number two, 51-year-old male with alcoholic cirrhosis underwent DVD liver transplant with ductal duct anastomosis. Alkaline phosphatase trending up at post-operative day 13 with pruritus. MRCP was obtained showing high-grade biliary anastomotic stenosis. Hepatic artery stenosis was unclear. CT scan was obtained to clarify this issue. CT scan confirmed hepatic artery focal high-grade stenosis as well as biliary stenosis. Subhepatic 15 centimeter fluid collection was seen consistent with biloma suggestive of ongoing bile leak. Patient underwent ERCP and contrast injection showed filling defect consistent with bile duct stone. Anastomotic stricture was visible with contrast leak consistent with bile leak. Wire was attempted to pass to the donor duct. However, unfortunately, during the maneuver, this baldic stone migrated up and lodged at anastomosis, and it prevented further wire passage or any maneuvers to be performed. Therefore, it was decided to perform cholangioscopy with EHL to break the stone to access donor duct. Spyglass cholangioscope was brought in 
and freehand cannulation was performed to access the bile duct. Cholangioscope was gently advanced to the distal bile duct, and under direct division, it was advanced proximally. Care was taken not to infuse water extensively to avoid further water leak from anastomosis. Mucus was seen, this is aspirated, and pigment stone was visible at the end of recipient duct. EHL was performed and multiple applications were necessary to break the stone to view the anastomosic site. Gradually, anastomosis became visible. Bioflow was seen coming off from anastomotic site. And there's acute angulation visible at this anastomosis. Wire passage was initially difficult due to the acute angulation. And using fluoroscopic and endoscopic guidance, wire was directed towards the donor duct and was successfully passed to the donor duct. At this time, spyglass cholangioscope was exchanged to the dilation balloon and anastomotic dilation was performed. Stent was placed with a plan to reevaluate the site in four weeks. I would like to go over the biliary complication after the liver transplant. Early complications are the ones occurring within 30 days of the transplant. Anastomotic structure and bile leak predominates during this period. Delayed complication occurs after 30 days of transplant. In addition to anastomotic structure, non-anastomotic structure and biliary cast syndrome start to occur. Risk factors for biliary complications are longer ischemic time, hepatic artery compromise, including stenosis and thrombosis. This is a significant risk factor for ischemic cholangiopathy. Higher donor age was associated with biliary complications. It is important to know that DCD liver is increasingly used in the United States. This type of liver has more biliary complications. We reported 34% of biliary complications with DCD liver transplant compared to 10 to 25% of DBD liver transplant. Transplant outcomes appear to be similar with graft survival. ERCP with cast removal and stent therapy had been effective in about 85% of patients with biliary complications, avoiding retransplant. Patient was brought back for re-evaluation of stenosis. Bile leak has resolved and the stenosis appeared to be mildly improved. However, there were filling defects diffusely seen within the intrahepatic bile duct, suggestive of biliary cast syndrome. Multiple stents were placed to treat anastomotic structure for future treatment of biliary cast syndrome. Patient was brought back confirming the improvement of anastomotic structure. However, intrahepatic findings worsens with almost disappearance of the left intrahepatic duct. Cast removal was done extensively with repeated balloon sweep and re redirection of wire to multiple delivery system. Improvement of visualization was confirmed and the right side is also cleaned. Stents were replaced. However, patient just returned within a week with signs of cholangitis.
repeat the RCP confirmed clean right anterior branch. However, left intrahepatic duct was not clearly seen. Careful wire direction to the multiple left intrahepatic duct was done with subsequent sweeps to clean the ducts. Stents were replaced. Unfortunately, recurrent fever noted despite repeat ERCPs and at this point MRI was performed. He underwent IR intervention for the treatment of cholangitis. Right posterior branch was untreated during the last several ERCPs. This duct was accessed by IR. This case underscores the importance of the review of the past ERCP films, especially in patients with ischemic cholangiopathy. Right posterior branch was visible at earlier ERCP with some area of stenosis. However, in the picture in the center showed very faint right posterior branch, suggestive of occlusion with biliary cast. This duct was accessed percutaneously to treat cholangitis. Case number three, 54 years old lady with Lynch syndrome presented with obstructive jaundice and intrahepatic ductal dilation. ERCP with dilation brush biopsy were done and plastic stents were placed to the right and the left. Two seven French by 12 centimeter were placed in the right and eight and a half French by 15 centimeter to the left. She was subsequently diagnosed with hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, bismuth type 3b. She continued to have intermittent abdominal pain after ERCP and later the pain became constant 10 days afterward. Due to the unusual circumstances, CT scan of the abdomen pelvis was ordered. CT findings were significant for prominent left intrahepatic duct dilation despite the stent in place. Stent appeared to be distally migrating. Looking at the distal part of the biliary stent, one of the three stents appeared to extend distally and even more distally out of the duodenal lumen with surrounding higher density. These findings are consistent with distal migration with duodenal perforation with the stent. Stent migration is reported to occur in about 10% of plastic stents. They equally go inward or outward. Majority of distally migrated stents are passed spontaneously without consequences. However, there are case reports of intestinal perforation and abscess formation with migrated stent. Early recognition is the key. If patient complains abnormal abdominal pain that lasts longer than usual after the ERCP requires further investigation. Duodenal perforation frequently be treated conservatively with antibiotics after stent removal and closure. Perforation closure can be successful with endoclip or over the scope clip. Patient with peritoneal sign may require surgery. Patient was brought into the endoscopy suite for the evaluation of stent sites. One of the stent has migrated distally and has penetrated through the duodenal wall. Using a rat tooth forceps, stent was grabbed and pulled longitudinally not to tear the site of perforation. 
significant force was required to pull this tent out of the perforation site. Perforation site had minor bleeding and the size of the perforation was small. We decided to close this site securely with over the scope clip. Over the scope clip device was mounted on endoscope and perforation site was centered and suction was applied. Over the scope clip was then deployed. Biliary stent was replaced with plastic stents, including double pigtail stent to prevent distal migration. Seventy years old gentleman who had right hepatectomy for cholangiocarcinoma developed stenotic area at the hilum. Multiple stents were placed for ongoing stent dilation therapy. One of those stents migrated inward, but it was left for future retrieval. At the following ERCP, the stent has migrated slightly inward and retrieval effort failed despite multiple attempts. There are multiple retrieval methods available for inwardly migrated stent. Extraction balloon can be inflated proximal to the stent and perform extraction motion in hope to move the stent distally. Dilation balloon can be inflated alongside the stent to increase the friction and perform extraction motion. Basket, forceps, snare can be used to capture the stent or stent, stent flange. However, these methods are difficult to use within the narrow segment. Cholangioscopy can identify the problem within the duct and the situation of the stent. Coaxial wire placement may be possible that allows the use of Sohendra stent retriever. Difficulty typically increases with stenotic area distal to the stent or branch duct present distal to the stent or acute angulation. When it's difficult, direct visualization usually helps. Patient was brought back for an attempt to retrieve the stent. Distal side of the stent appeared to be residing at common hepatic duct. Initially, using an angled wire, attempt was made to pass the wire coaxially, but it failed. Extraction balloon was passed to remove the stent distally, but this did not move the stent. Therefore, we performed cholangioscopy using spyglass to evaluate the situation. The tip of the stent actually buried within the bowel duct wall. Therefore, attempt was made to pass the, the wire coaxially from the side hole, and this was successful. So Hendra Retriever was employed in hope to engage at the side hole, but full engagement was not possible. Repeat evaluation with the cholangioscope showed that stent was further pushed inward, exposing distal end of the stent. Using this opportunity, an angled wire, the wire was attempted to pass coaxially from the distal end of the stent and this was successful. Wire was advanced and Sohendra retriever was reinserted and engaged into the stent successfully this time. Gentle pull motion was performed not to break the stent 
and the stent was retrieved. Plastic stents were replaced with two stents, including one double pigtail stent to prevent migration. I think that's it. Somehow this is playing again, but thank you very much for your attention. Wow. Sorry being a little thank late. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Norio. Um, just a couple of uh, brief questions. Um, sure. With Hyler strictures uh, or Hyler issues, um, in, at least in the United States, is it fair to say that uh, single operator cholangioscopy plays a fairly critical role now. Are you using it in most Hyler strictures for, um, for diagnosis as well as perhaps for stent placement? That's a great question. Um, so if you add a direct cholangioscopy with a biopsy, the sensitivity of diagnosis increases. Um, however, um, you, we have to know that uh, the cholangi cholangitis risk increases as well. Um, from the Colorado, we reported about 3% uh, um, cholangitis with the uh, use of cholangioscopy compared to uh, about 1%. So given that, um, we tend to uh, perform first uh, brushing biopsy with uh, forceps, uh, fluoroscopy guided, and add the fish. Uh, you know, mayo is a really uh, advocate of adding fish to diagnose as hybrid dysplasia and cancer, um, ruling out from um, excluding, I mean, uh, separating from benign stricture. Then if that uh, doesn't reveal and the suspicion is uh, high, then we go back in with the cholangioscope. So that's a uh, second uh, step actually we're, we're taking. Okay, so it's- Do you uh, agree with this? Uh, yeah. When, uh... When do you uh, use metal stents uh, for um, uh, advanced uh, malignant hyaluronic structures? That, that's really controversial. And, um, you know, uh, at this time, uh, our care for the cancer is improving and uh, the prognosis or survival is getting longer. Um, once you put the metal stent, um, if there's occlusion, the recovery gets really difficult. And those patients uh, end up in having a percutaneous strain, which has uh, the adverse event up to 30% with a leak and pain. We tend to uh, reserve that for uh, really advanced and uh, the, the end stage uh, angiocarcinoma patient, uh, which uh, we judge about two, three months survival uh, then we end up in uh, putting a metal stent. But uh, if uh, until the oncologists give up the hope, then we tend to keep going uh, with the plastic stent and ongoing change. Norio. Do you agree with that approach? You know, it's, think, it's uh, Norio, I tend to do the same thing. Go ahead, Greg. No, no, I was just going to yeah, say I, that. I was going to uh, say it's remarkable that we've observed the, the same type of phenomena that we've We've, you know, a, a generation ago, we learned that, that straight stents were superior to double pigtail stents, but for the reasons that you described with, with anterograde and retrograde migration, we've, we've moved back towards using uh, double pigtail stents. And as you said, because um, patients are now outliving the biotolerance of metal mesh stents at the hilum, uh, we have uh, similarly relied on plastic stenting until very end stage disease. No, I just wanted to Great point out. One, yeah, uh, just one complication of the stent migration that you might not have appreciated, Norio. I'll put it up here for the audience to see. Oh, oh whoa! <laughs> <laughs> no, this was really important. bad complication. <laughs> so, <laughs> if one of your stent cases has a scrotal abscess, you know, do a flat plate <laughs> of the abdomen. <laughs> Don't let that happen to you. And on that note.